Today on This Week in Startups, it's our weekly news roundtable. This week, Aaron Walter, the lead UX designer at MailChimp, is with us. He's brilliant. Liz Gaines, the senior editor at All Things D, she is also brilliant. Uh, they both join us remotely. Tyler Crowley and Lon Harris are in studio. Let's do this. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Ah, uh, yes, we're back, we're back. It's this week in startups. Um, I love the news roundtable. We're in about week three or four of the news roundtable. Four. This is the third one I've been here for. Yeah. So then only total. the first, only the three you're here at count. So exactly. Everybody exactly. is really loving Lon being back on the show. It feels good to be back. It does. I'm, I'm happy yeah. to be. Here. We always had such a good time. It's a it's a fun uh, it's fun, a fun chance to catch up yeah. and talk about the news. Talk and all that talk stuff. smack. Etc. Um, hey, one thing that's working really well for us here at this weekend is the twistlist.co. Thirty-six people have uh, become producers of the show. They're all on a private email list, and I would like to personally thank executive producer Kyle Lonzo, Austin Miller, uh, Rashawn Sorle, Rob Kuntz, Greg Berry, and Sean Lynch. Those are my new executive producers. Thanks for signing on, guys and gals. Uh, also, producer Ildar Kamiv. Kakamov. Kakamov. Somebody's going to have to help me with this, the phonetic spellings, because I am dyslexic. And uh, our supporters, and supporters are very important as well. Joa, Joal Fernand, and Piatris Tron. Piatris Tron. Um, thanks, guys. Thanks for joining the family. We'll see you on the email list, and you'll be helping us produce the show. Uh, boy, what a great show we're going to have today. Um, and we've got a great roundup of people and a great roundup of stories on the program. Uh, Liz Gaines, for the first time. Liz, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, awesome. Great. Welcome to the program. Uh, of course, you started working at All Things D when? End of last year. End of last um, year. Though today, as you might be able to see behind me, is the first day that I'm actually at the Down Jones <laughs> building in downtown San Francisco. So I'm in a cubicle. I oh. decided working from home was, uh, was getting a little lonely. It does get a little lonely. That is the problem. Uh, so thanks for joining us for the program. Looking forward to hearing your thoughts because I know you're covering a lot of the big news stories. Also uh, with us is Aaron. Um, Aaron was a judge. Um, Aaron Walter uh, was a judge at the launch conference and is actually, I, I asked on my Twitter, who is the product genius behind MailChimp? Mm -hmm. Turns out it's this kid Aaron from, I don't, where are they based? Aaron, where are you based? We're based in Atlanta. Atlanta. And you are uh, the lead user experience designer uh, at MailChimp. You make the beautiful product that I use every day. I am one of the people, uh, I'm the lead of the UX team, but they're, they're a team of smart folks that I work with, yeah. And um, also MailChimp has become a great supporter of the show. Uh, and thank you to them for that. Uh, I, talk about the, I talk about MailChimp every week. Do people at MailChimp actually listen to me talk about the product, Aaron? Is it like, uh, do people wonder oh, yeah. what I'm going to say every week? <laughs> Yeah, we love it. Uh, well, let me tell you what I'd like to say this week. The free plan, 2,000 subscribers and 12,000 emails per month. The free plan, always free. And the product is just elegant and simple and easy to use. Amazing. I keep, I keep flip-flopping back and forth. Do I want to do text emails? Do I want to do HTML emails? Mm -hmm. Do I want to see the open rate and this massive statistics that they provide? Or do I just want to go old school and do text? Today, I did old school text with my story on Skype. And uh, it's just great that it just goes out so fast. The last provider I have, I would send my email. I'd be waiting hours. I have to call three times. Oh, you're in mm -hmm. the queue. You're in the queue. You're in the queue. Six hours later, it comes out. You know, I'm in the speed business with news, and MailChimp gives me my entire edge. Go ahead and sign up for the launch newsletter, launch.is slash newsletter, and um, use that. So now we have uh, our 10 news stories. Lon, read us the first. Uh, well, the first highest voted uh, news story on Ranker.com this week was uh, Microsoft's acquisition of Skype. Wall Street Journal initially announced Monday evening Microsoft was acquiring telephony giant Skype for $8.5 billion. The move is Microsoft's most aggressive to date. Uh, Skype has been had been on the path towards an IPO. Uh, now it will be absorbed into pre-existing Microsoft online communications efforts. Uh, lots of debate discussion this week about where people thought Microsoft were going to use Skype, how it was going to be used. I know you wrote 
wrote a newsletter that went out today about yes. the issue. Uh, so, you know, what what do you think uh, for the people who didn't read the newsletter? Or give a little more detail. What 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 is the what is the idea here? How how is what is Steve Ballmer thinking, and how is Skype going to be integrated into Microsoft? I, I have my own my own thoughts. I want to hear Liz. Liz, uh, what do you think of this whole uh, Skype purchase? I want to know how Skype gained like five plus billion dollars in value in like less than a year and a year and a half or something since it went independent. I mean, I don't exactly get why uh, why Skype today is that different from Skype before. Why why the economic circumstances changed so much? Well, the user base has doubled. I think. So, if, if, but if it was double, you'd still be right. It's still then you're talking about four versus eight. Yeah, but they're still losing money too, and it's, you know it's the same service. It is the same service. It really doesn't change that much as a product. They did get a product release out that I actually don't like the user interface of. Um, but let's face it, the service has over six hundred million users. So, you don't like the new design either, right? Mm -mm. Aaron, do you use the product? What do you think of the design? You're a design expert. Uh, yeah, I do use it. I don't use it a ton. Um, I, I don't really have any qualms with it. Um, I, you know, there are some things that are kind of annoying. There's kind of like this semi-cluttered uh, left bar where you're seeing lots of different like kind of smart searches or something. People you've talked to recently, no way to customize that. That's a little tedious, but um, it. I mean, it's not so cumbersome that it's not usable. Yeah. Um, for me, the most most of the times, the problem I've ever had um, with Skype is just connection. That you know. Mm -hmm. whether I get a good connection and whether it sticks around. Yeah, I mean, the fidelity of Skype is always an issue. We had issues here on the program. Um, it typically has to do with your network having other things going on it or yeah. the machine having other things and going on it. And just Wi-Fi in general. I mean, it's sort of a known thing among podcasters and people doing shows you like this. You have to have a wireline. You have to be wired in to use Skype. You can't be on Wi-Fi. Yeah, we don't like anybody using Wi-Fi here uh, on Which it. Which is why I just ran all over San Francisco trying to get a <laughs> USB to, or Ethernet jack because... Right. I'm on a MacBook Air, which does not have an Ethernet out. Yeah, but you well, you sound perfect, but you look like you're standing perfectly still. Yes, well, still. I, I got it, but I had to go, uh, go <laughs> run through the city to find it. No, it seems the Staples main, doesn't sell them, just yeah, FYI. The main question people have is how is Skype going to integrate into Microsoft, but is, wouldn't it be... <clears throat> I wouldn't be surprised if Microsoft tries to integrate into Skype because it's more of a brand that people... Yeah, are, well, Microsoft uh, now passion. tends to manage <clears throat> things you know, uh, in groups, so Xbox does not have to suffer if Office is suffering, et cetera. So they've been actually pretty disciplined about saying, you know, this is Xbox, this is Windows 7. These things don't have to share a common everything. Right. Let's have excellence in pockets. Well, I, I love this purchase it because... Was, it was only a month ago that Microsoft put out the open office and all that, right? Yeah. I think the uptick on that was probably less than they had ho yeah. hoped or expected. This is a way to put in document sharing and everything else in through the back door of Skype. Yeah. I mean, listen, it, you have hundreds of millions of members, and that's going to drive usage of any number of products. And the integration of Skype and the Xbox Live community, which is already on headsets, mm -hmm. could be a very powerful combination. I sort of talked about in my newsletter today, hey, you know, they basically bought the underpinnings of a social network. When Every time you hear Zuckerberg talk in the last year or two, it's been about communications. The instant message, Mebo, knockoff they point. did. You have all a good percentage of Email. your address book in there. You already do. And, you, and Buzz had a tremendous success, actually, in building a social network based upon your address book initially, but they canned the project. I hear Larry Page didn't like it. That's a rumor. I don't have any <laughs> substantiation of that. He didn't tell me that. Um, not that we're BFF anyway. But anyway, there is this sort of possibility that your Skype page, your Skype network could become, and I actually put a mock-up of it in the launch newsletter, hey, this could become a social network. I'm not, I, don't, I think it's a 10% chance, or 20% chance, but the amount of money they spend, the tens of billions of dollars they spend on research to buy one of the five most loved internet brands, um, I don't think the price matters all that much if they paid an extra two or three billion when they're spending, you know, tens of millions of dollars a day on R and D that hasn't seemed to I don't have know released this, anything I don't amazing. Know if how how out this came? An internal source at Microsoft told me this was all European Asian money that they had that they could spend over there because it was based out of Estonia or wherever. Uh, oh yes. or whatever. So it was oh, pre-tax so money. Yeah. Right, and this is the repatriation issue that right. I talked about on a, on a previous program, which is. American companies are getting a haircut if they bring money in from outside the United States. Right. The majority of revenue at companies like Google, Microsoft, Facebook is either coming from or will come from outside the United States to bring it in 50% tax or as much as that. Mm -hmm. If they leave it out there, they can acquire things outside the United States right. and it's just a and, they, yeah, they they're basically getting two for one dollar. So if they paid 50% more than they should, they still, you know, they're still saving money essentially. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I mean, I like it. I think it's a great buy. 
and why were they able to close this deal so effectively and not the Yahoo deal? Is Bomber getting better at buying internet companies? I mean, it, it feels like he did this one so, you know, deftly. Like, listen, you can't negotiate with anybody else. We're going to pay yeah. an extra $2 billion. Your IPO would have been $7 billion. Here's an extra $2 billion. Yeah, it seems like, and, and it was so, you know, so fair. There wasn't this awkward, like, weeks of will they, won't they, like we yeah. had with other deals. It was like, here's this is happening. Yeah, he gave them a massive premium. Yeah. Uh, but it does, it does make you wonder, is eBay stupid? I mean, that's sort of what you're getting at, Liz, isn't it? Well, maybe it wasn't the right fit for them. I don't know. Or maybe they weren't like, willing to put the resources into it it needed. But, I mean, why didn't they then just take it public themselves and spin it out and get the $7 billion instead of selling it for two, right? It didn't seem like they really had much love for it anymore. They're, you know, they're focused elsewhere. They think PayPal's their big business. And, but, and the interesting thread is obviously Mark Andreessen, who's on the board of Facebook mm -hmm. and on the board of Skype. And is he on the board of eBay, too? Somebody's check. got to check that. I, I, I know he had an affiliation. I think he might be. So it's amazing. And then he also uh, uh, put in well, yeah, it was a his, quarter million right. dollars. A quarter billion dollars. So he tr he doubles or triples his money. He's one of, yeah. He's, he's in he's flipping clearly. it. Yeah, so, you're right, Jason. He joined in uh, 2008. He did join yeah. eBay. So I, I don't, listen, Mark's a friend, Spencer. sort of a quasi friend of mine. So I'm not saying anything's funny going on here. But you join the board of eBay. eBay sells Skype for... How much? Two or three billion? Two billion, right? Two billion or something. You put two hundred fifty million of your fund's money in it. Mm -hmm. You then sell it to Microsoft for double or triple. <laughs> so you triple yeah. your money. You make a half billion dollars on the sale. I I guess yeah. This is he's, so he's doing all right. Hey, no conflict, no interest. <laughs> uh, yeah. No conflict, no interest. Moving on to the next story. Yeah, good year. Uh, it's actually moved up into the number one story in the time we were talking about the last story. Chromebooks, Google Chromebooks, notebook computers that will run Chrome OS, uh, cloud-based operating system. So uh, Chrome OS is only going to run web-based applications through a Chrome browser. This is going to give it more battery life and make the whole thing a little bit uh, faster. They're going to be available beginning June 15th. The initial releases are coming from Samsung and Acer. Samsung's device is going to have a 12.1 inch screen, eight hours of bat battery life. It will run you $429 with Wi-Fi, only $499 with a 3G option. Acer, it's a little bit smaller, it's got a little bit less battery life, but it starts at $349. But here's the even bigger, I think, potential game changer. There may be plans to allow people to rent these Chromebooks for as little as $20 a month. So how disruptive do you see this being to the PC and laptop market as it stands right now? Um, and do you think this means we really will, as Google is saying, never get a Chrome OS tablet? And it's uh, down to 20, 20 bucks a month for schools and governments, too, so that's even cheaper. Yeah. I mean, it's astounding, and, I, you know, I, I get the sense that this is a game-changing, huge, huge thing. And the reason I say that is because when Google Docs came out and Google Apps, everybody poo-pooed it. Oh, my God, you, nobody's going to do this. Why would I give up Office? It makes no mm -hmm. sense. The spreadsheet sucks. The word processor sucks. It freezes. I can't get my documents if I'm on a plane, blah, blah, blah. But visionary as Google can be, they said, well, listen, you're going to have your interconnection more and more often, mm -hmm. and we'll figure out a way to get these things offline, which they're going to have this summer. They're doing, yeah. Um, and every company that I have invested in, 25 angel companies, I've got four companies I've started in the last couple of years, I think almost everybody is using Google Apps for domains. For 25 or 50 bucks a month, you get this flawless service per employee. No, it's 50 bucks per year. Yeah. Take it back. It's like three or four dollars per year per employee. Now you're at 20 bucks to it to get the laptop and I don't have to worry about people doing all, I mean, everybody spends 95% of their day in the browser. Mm -hmm. This is massively game changing. Is, you know, some big company like Goldman Sachs going to get rid of all their PCs? Is some startup with, you know, 500 Macs going to get rid of them? No, but you can, you can guarantee that some department will get 20 of these or a it's small business support. or a startup. Yeah. And the support cost of Windows is three or four thousand dollars per machine. The support cost of this is going to be throw the thing in the garbage and <laughs> just hand the person yeah. in. They're disposable. Uh, what do you think, Aaron? Well, I think it's pretty amazing um, and game changing for support teams to be able to use something like this that's sandboxed, that's secure. If you're interacting with a lot of customers and worried about security issues, it's really perfect for that. Um, I also love that instead of you know typical support team situations, their setups are going to be desktop machines where they're tethered to, um, you know, to their chair and their desk. Um, and this lets people, you know, travel around and kind of work in a convenient place. So I think it's brilliant. It's a, it's a cool idea. And I think it's really interesting for schools. Um, the one thing I think is a little bit weird, I think it's perfect for that niche market, but for the general consumer, um, like for your mom, 
I still think an iPad makes more sense, you know, someone that's maybe uh, not as familiar with technology. Uh, because of the laptop form factor, uh, I think some people will not get, like, there's no file storage area, there's no desktop. That stuff's going to be vexing for novice users. But um, for, for business users, I think it's fantastic. Uh, Liz, what are your thoughts on this? Is this a big deal or not? Well, the thing is, I feel like the offline stuff is a bigger deal for, I mean, if, if you can't, you if something stops functioning when you go offline, then, then you're really not going to be satisfied with the experience. And right now, I mean, I have all these apps on my phone and stuff, but when I go on Muni in San Francisco, when you go underground, I mean, I think the only thing I can use is Angry Birds. So, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's... Um, if I remember, you know, and to sync my Instapaper, then I have a good, you know, something to read while I'm on my ride. But if, if you're thinking of these things as highly portable, you also want them to be online all the time. And I don't think that's really up to the offline access and, or, and, or universal broadband. I don't think are really up to the, the standard yet. Yeah, not yet, but I will say I'm like using Evernote right now. I'm a huge Evernote fan. I'm obsessed with Evernote. And I'm I'm basically told them if you get Evernote to sync with my Google Docs, I'm never going to open Google Docs again because I have the Evernote desktop client, I have the iPad client, and all my stuff's in there. And then I have a secret email address to email my stuff to Evernote. Mm -hmm. So if you send me a PDF or you send me show notes in an email, I make it a document just by forwarding it there on an email. So I'm just this huge Evernote fan. It's it's amazing. And there's absolutely no reason why Evernote could not, or an Evernote-like product could not be the OS of uh, the file OS of this and Dropbox the same thing and mm-hmm. you, you got to think that Jobs is thinking the same thing with his huge data center right plenty of rumors of Dropbox being uh, acquired by Apple Microsoft and Google I've heard all three companies tried to buy them right um, and they turned it down so uh, you know it, it feels like we're at the, at the on the verge of this massive revolution Tyler your thoughts on it um, you and I had a an aha moment a year ago in Tokyo at the at a big department store, gadget store, where they were giving they literally give away laptops. Yeah. If you sign up for the three G, sell the three G contract. Yeah. Um, this seems like what you know, and that's actually working really well there. It's in every department store you go into in the lobby. Um, it seems like this that would be the inevitable addition to this offering, which is. And it touches on Liz's point, like get the bundled connectivity through Verizon and the laptop's free and, you know, something. Yeah, it's interesting. Almost Maybe how, for $5 more a month you could yeah. you know, make that happen. Almost like how the game console makers, they're willing to take a loss on the console because they're getting you into Xbox Live. Yeah, I mean, obviously, if you do or, this, let's say I pay $50 a year for Google, Chrome, for, for Google Apps. Mm-hmm. Now it, I could just have a checkbox that says send a laptop to this person for... You know, uh, instead of fifty dollars a year, if this was a three-year contract or whatever, for two fifty a year, and I could just provision it that way and just yeah. mail directly to the person if they work from home or wherever. And you know what? People might have two or three of these things in their house. They might have one for one. You know, you used to have four clients. What if yeah. all four just issued you one and you return yeah. it when you're back? And it's there, like Aaron's saying, it's their controlled operating system, it's their controlled well, look and, and feel. And yeah, and I mean, the stuff like that would be amazing. Instead of you know having to search through your Google Docs or your Evernotes every single time to find what you're looking for, you've just got a laptop for every assignment it's that you're the, working on. The one thing that it does lead to, though, is it makes me start to feel like Microsoft '98, where they there's so dominant, like they use this as a way to maintain their dominance in search or, you know, dot, Well, all of this is about kicking Microsoft in the nuts while putting a huge moat around the Google search business. Yes. But doesn't it get to a point where all you have to... What? What was that? We've got a producer. Producer Matt (laughs) from Finland and associate producer Ricardo from Australia. Every time you hear those words, an angel gets his wings. I expect a little train to come behind you. Is your... (laughs) (laughs) Zuzu's pedals. Ah, Zuzu. I love that film. Uh, So anyway, that's great. we got two more producers uh, on the show. They have the whole thing locked down. Some company's going to say, why can't I get my, you know, software on there? And they're uncles, you know, on the board of, you know, mm-hmm. in the government, and, and the whole thing is going to crack open. It's like they're leading themselves into an argument of, you know... Monopoly? Of monopoly. No, no, they're not leading themselves into an argument of monopoly. They're in an argument <laughs> of monopoly right now with multiple states, and I hear a rumor that the FTC investigation about this um, medical stuff is also very deep into search. Liz, what are you hearing about the FTC and Google? Oh, that they're, uh, they're cracking down on... Uh, fake pharmacies listing things or illicit yeah. pharmacies well, listing that was ads. The, that's the $500 million settlement for that. But mm-hmm. there's a rumor going around town that the FTC is deep up inside Google regarding yeah. search results and search monopoly. 
I actually can't hear you anymore. Oh, so I was saying. Uh, sorry that's that's one way to dodge it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> one way to dodge the question. Hey, very well done. I'm sorry. I think my Skype broke out. It must be the Microsoft operating system now running on the Skype servers. For the love of God, Microsoft, do not force Skype to do that. Yeah. Um, no, the question was. Do you, are you hearing what I'm hearing, that the FTC is investigating Google over search as well? Yeah, but that's been going on for a while, right? I mean, people yeah. have been trying to implicate Google for, for keeping its algorithm secret and all that. Yeah, but it seems like people are starting to get phone calls. It feels like it's ramping up uh, mm -hmm. at, you know, at this point in time. Um, anyway, let's go on to the next yeah, story. Yeah, well, they're, they're all about openness, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the Google. Yes. yes. They're open. It, you know, it's, it's like they say, you're open unless you're winning. So whatever, mm -hmm. wherever you've got your monopoly, you're not open. I mean, the Google Panda update just shows that. I mean, they're, they don't want to explain anything about that to anybody. But, no. you know, they're more than happy to make Chrome <laughs> and Android, Android open yeah. and Docs and all this stuff. Everything's open, open, open. But then when it comes to the thing where they make 98% of their revenue, Google's suddenly closed and they have nothing to say. What? Yeah, I don't hold that against them too badly, though. No, I mean, listen. If they're keeping, if they were keeping spam out of the index, it would be one thing. But they're not keeping spam out of the index. It's actually search results have gotten worse. Uh, which I just changed. I just it boggles my mind how targeted they could get when they eventually roll out this Groupon competitor. How Groupon, as great as it is, and the Daily Deals as great as they are, are not that targeted. Like I keep getting, you know, hair treatment <laughs> stuff. Like a, yeah, I got much use for that. <laughs> not gonna happen. Right. So Google, you know. Knowing that I'm bald, uh, <laughs> yes, and and fifty other things about me um, through my new laptop and yeah. Chrome will. Um, that's the part that I'm waiting to see unfold. Yeah, let's go to the next. Uh, per perfect transition talking about uh, Google being potentially sleazy. According to Dan Lyons in the Daily Beast, Facebook mm. had hired Burson Marsteller, a top public relations firm, to put negative stories about Google into the press. Uh, it's been confirmed since from a Facebook spokesperson that indeed the PR firm was brought in and they cited, they, Facebook was citing what they felt were genuine concerns about Google's invasions of user privacy and in general antipathy based on Google's efforts to utilize Facebook data. Uh, much of the debate I internally surrounds Google social circle feature, allowing Gmail users to see not only their contacts, but friends of friends and other secondary connections. Uh, so obviously a public humiliation for Facebook to be caught sort of with their hand in the cookie jar using this kind of corporate espionage type scheme. But is, there, is anyone going to be willing to step up to Facebook's defense? Uh, with all the talk about Google potentially invading user privacy, do they deserve to be investigated more than they are? Liz, what are your thoughts? Well, I think there's one question that I haven't really seen answered, which is what exactly is is google scraping anything that they shouldn't be scraping um there are some people who are alleging that google is going through people's email notifications to see which services they were connected to and who they're connected to on them but if you look and see on their you know the social circle feature which has actually been renamed um to something else it's just like a list of it's like your dynamic your, your social profile on google it shows what you're connected to if you look at that now they say these are the three ways that you get your we get your information and it's all already public we're just going out and finding it on these sites um, so I think that Facebook thinks there's something um, skeezy going on and, you know, they would probably know because they know what information is public and what is private. But more, you know, you're right. I mean, everything's all about this competitive issue and there's no way that Facebook doesn't look bad in this. Yeah, it, it, it's, it seems so unnecessary to hire a PR firm mm -hmm. to get Google in trouble when Google is knee deep in trouble and you are the privacy breaking bad boy of the internet. Well, I think, to me, that's why they did it. It's like, hey, maybe we can make Google out to look like, oh, they're as just bad as, as bad. As bad as we do. Right. right. Yeah. Like, make themselves look a little better by making their main competitor Bring look worse. Bring them down to the mud pit that they're already in. That's what huh. I assumed. Huh. Like, the best way to, to distract people from your own issues is to figure out somebody else who's doing the same thing and be like, oh, but we're, I'm just like them. Look at that. They're even worse. It, it, yeah, I don't think that's a theory. I think that's a fact. That's yeah. exactly what was going on. <laughs> uh, now, so Liz, as a journalist, uh, are you getting... Um, or is it common as a tech journalist to get PR firms whispering in your ear saying negative, negative, you didn't get it from me, but negative about this person, negative about that person? Yeah, you know, it's not it's it's not as much of a black and white issue as people are making it out to be. There certainly certainly are always attempts by um, companies to plant stories about their competitors or just to kind of, you know, say as an aside, hey, I'm not sure what's going on here. I mean, you're not going to spread bad stories about yourself. But, you know, it's more common in other circles probably in, like, political journalism and stuff like that. But as for the way this was handled, I think what was so bad about it was that it was so explicit. It was like, 
we're pitching the story. We won't tell you who it's from. We want to do it in this kind of secret way. And it's by this company, which like is trying, has, has painted an image of itself that is not this kind of, um, it's always trying to get away, not just from the privacy issues, but from doubts about its trustworthiness. So it's, it's coming from a bad place. So poorly executed as well. Like from Facebook, which does such a good job at building product, uh, mm -hmm. and from a huge PR firm that you think would know better. Why would a PR firm take such an assignment? I mean, how much do you think Facebook paid them to do this? A million dollars? You know what's weird is I don't even, I've never worked with that PR firm. I mean, everyone yeah. has been citing them as this big PR firm, but maybe they're big in other yeah. topics, other circles. They're big. I mean, uh, but would a, why would a PR firm take on a job like that? I mean, that just makes no sense. No, the whole thing is kind of unclear. And then it's also, you know, these former journalists are, took it on. And now at the latest report I saw was that now the PR firm is saying that they are giving their journalists, their, their, their employees, their former journalists, ethics training in journalism. So, it's, I mean, oh, the whole thing is really awkward. Wow, that's, a, that's great. I mean, that yeah. solves everything. I mean, also in related news, the Galleon hedge fund guy mm -hmm. is uh, going to get, you know, driving lessons. Yeah, I mean, Bernie give me a Madoff's break. giving financial ethics Absolutely, lessons. yeah, he's going to be giving uh, financial I heard about yeah. that, yeah. Uh, Aaron, what are your thoughts on this whole uh, boondoggle? Is MailChimp, uh, is MailChimp uh, hiring a PR firm to slander your competitors? Yes, sir. Yeah, most certainly not. <laughs> I mean, it's it's one of those things like Facebook does stupid stuff like this, and I I I think that for the most part, like we'll see the stupidity and the irony of this, um, and it's sort of you know transparently um, a bad idea. But I think it's kind of inside baseball, and for general users, they won't really care. It seems like you know all of the for all of the issues that Facebook has had with. Um, privacy and whatnot, it's uh, its sort of like the crack of the web. I don't really think that there's anything right now that could uh, put Facebook in a, in a bad spot um, in terms of PR. Well, yeah. China. Yeah. Oh, yeah, good point. China would, uh, if they operate in China and start turning dissidents and journalists and protesters over to the Chinese government, which is what the Chinese government will require, which is why Sheryl Sandberg says she does not want to go to China, but she will acquiesce according to, I guess, a Forbes or Fortune report. Yeah. She will acquiesce. Um, Zuckerberg is actually willing yeah, to was, send uh, people to death Bloomberg, camps? Actually. Or Bloomberg, yeah, I guess we give, give credit where credit's due. I mean, are you telling me Zuckerberg would allow Facebook to operate in China knowing that Facebook will send people to their deaths and to prison camps and hard labor for the rest of their lives for freedom of speech issues? I mean... Who in their right mind would operate a business? A million users isn't cool. Well, it's a billion users. So, right. I mean, hey, it's just, you don't get 500 million people in prison camps without, you know... <laughs> you know making a few yeah, enemies. Yeah, making a few yeah, enemies. Right. You don't, yeah. uh, I mean, it's such a huge bargain. It's got to be such a huge temptation. I, I don't know that he well, would and then he's, this that, whole. But. I don't buy this whole, like, we can be an agent of change from the inside out. Well, obviously, that's how you'd spin it if you were going to go do I that. I see. This is why... You look at... I mean, the F... TC is investigating an all up inside Google, which I would describe Google's bad behavior in the naughty category, where mm -hmm. you start look, listing Facebook's behavior, it's in the nefarious category. You know? Like, if the yeah. reports of how Zuckerberg sold and stole the Facebook over and over again, like, mm -hmm. he was selling half to this guy who was the plumber guy. That's always weird. And he when was those selling half to out, this yeah. guy, and this founder had, I mean, he basically was like the producers. He sold 400% of Facebook. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, right. but I mean, that kind of stuff, like, that turns into a good movie, like it already did. Yeah. But I think the the, the China issue, like, and I, I, I think what you're downplaying maybe a little bit too much, I think it really is very likely to happen. I mean, that's something I've been reporting on pretty closely, just given that, it seems like it could have such a global impact. This is something that people are actually going to care about. Like people caring about Zuckerberg being um, like a uh, an immature guy in college, and when he was starting this company, that actually turned out to be really influential. But he didn't know at the time. Like, yeah, he looks really scuzzy, but um, I think the ultimate PR impact of that is the movie. But you know, going like you're saying, like getting involved in these human rights issues. There's getting involved in, in Congress, questioning them about their involvement in China, freedom of speech. I mean, this is stuff that people actually really care about on a larger scale. Yeah, and it, he, so now is what you're saying, Liz, that there's like the naughty behavior of youth that has largely been forgiven and memorialized, in fact, in a movie, and now we have the naughtiness of an adult who is very savvy. Of a corporation. Of a corporation that's hiring PR to do slander campaigns and wants yeah. to go into China knowing that unequivocally, 
a social network operating in a socialist, communist environment like that will result in freedom of speech and people being you know, hindered and people yeah. being put in death in prison camps. Well, it's, it's not hypothetical. I mean, I think that's a, it's, this is not like I us would saying, never. oh, this might happen if they go to jail. We're seeing it happen in Middle Eastern countries where there's protesting and Twitter's being used to find people. Yeah. And so, I mean, we know that the, it's established that if Facebook operates in China, but just this think will about happen. it. Like, Twitter and, you know, uh, Google would never operate and do that kind of stuff. And even Yahoo, which made the mistake of doing it, they moved and divested out of China. I mean, this is a huge issue. You're right, Liz. Like, why aren't people talking about this? The fact that you would even consider operating under their rules in their country and turning people over to the Gestapo, it's the same as turning people over to the Nazis. Is it? Just, is there, am, am I overstating the case? Well, we don't know exactly how it's going to be executed yet. And I think there's also this argument that Facebook has been a pretty strong force of democracy. Um, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. I mean, you know, the while Gonim, the Google executive who has been credited with leading a lot of the youth revolution in Egypt, like he says, Mark Zuckerberg is my hero. You know, using Facebook was the reason we were able to get this done. So I think that that's the way that Mark Zuckerberg sees it. He's not, you know, I don't think he's like a... At this point, I don't think he's scheming to uh, Make more infringe money. on people's uh, <laughs> human rights. I right. think he's thinking about how can he have the most impact on the world. And the way he can have the most impact on the world is not by excluding this huge portion of it. And the way that they're talking about it is they're trying to do it in a way that they would bring, they would have Chinese users have a not a separate version of their site but be connected to the rest of, of their network because that's the way that they would you know, bring the open type of communication that we have on the rest of the network into China. But obviously the, um, the way that they would copyright the government is going to be highly questionable. And it's not like with Google where it's like, you know, we're censoring some search results for some somewhat sensitive things. This is actually a service that people use to connect to each other and to organize and yes. to the force democracy. Yes, the fallout is huge. I mean, if you were to catch one person, you would have the whole network of everybody in the association. I mean, this is why Twitter is so dangerous in a, in a, in a you know, um, you know, what do they call the spring revolution over there in, in all the countries? Jasmine. Jasmine. Yeah. The ja this is what the whole Jasmine revolution has as a problem. As much as this can empower, if you get the whole social network and you're willing to shoot people like they are in some of these countries, sure. Syria, I guess, is shooting people. Syria, a and dead Bahrain, in the street. and Libya. I mean, I mean they're shooting people down the yeah. street. So, what we, I mean, if they find out, hey, you're the leader and you have 100 followers, just shoot all 100. And, and it's the way that these systems work. I mean, they, they do allow for this kind of organization, but they also kind of work against it. I mean, but if what if it's 20,000 followers? What if it's, you know, 50,000 followers? What if it, what if Facebook Facebook in China actually flips the opposite way, yeah. that if you have scale, it's really hard to kill 50,000 people. You can kill 100 people, but, you know, when it gets to a certain scale, it's a mob. And, you know, yeah. we saw what happened. We, we are, we're already seeing what happens with mobs in the Middle yeah. East. And, and we saw what happened in Tiananmen Square. And sure. we saw what happened in the killing field. So, I mean, yes, it can go either way. Um, and if it goes the other way, I mean, you could be talking about 100,000 people or 50,000 people. Who knows how many people were murdered in Tiananmen Square? I don't think it's that number, but we know what happened in the killing fields. I mean, yeah. I'll right. tell you, if I, were, if I were Hillary Clinton, I would be at Facebook and Twitter on a regular basis consulting and talking about how, uh, you know, United States national interests could be um, brought to pass through social networks. That's a Yeah, really but you know, it's great. actually been... It's been interesting to see Twitter and Facebook's different um, acknowledgments of that role. I think Twitter has been a lot more explicit about saying we are um, a force of social good um, and even to the point where I think the after some of the revolutions in the Middle East, the, someone from the from someone from the White House actually went on record saying like that the right to social network is a fundamental privilege, um, <laughs> which is like kind of insane. But then if you talk to people at Facebook about it, they're like, don't you know, keep us kind of keep us out of it. We don't want to be known as an overthrower of governments because we actually want to do that, but we don't want governments to think of us that way. Hmm. This is a major issue. There should be some agreement between all corporations in America of how to deal with China and freedom of speech and stuff like that. It should be a, because what's going to happen is now Facebook's going to go in and then it's like, oh, now every other shareholder and all these other companies has to think, oh, Facebook's going in and they're going to compromise. Now I have to compromise because I'm costing my shareholders dollars. Yeah, I mean, the one, the yeah, one that, if, if, go, go And ahead. not only that, but there's companies, you know, now there's Chinese companies, the biggest uh, Chinese social network just went public in the U.S. last week. So, and, and I mean, this was, this is not, 
fully substantiated, but they express an interest in buying MySpace. So to think about like a Chinese company with fed by U.S. investment coming and competing on American turf, I mean, there's just some crazy stuff going on here that's going to come out pretty soon. I feel like I'm in a William Gibson novel. Uh, <laughs> hey, when we come back, what is the next story? Uh, we're going to talk about Y Combinator and their summer session. I have a lot to say about 60 companies joining Y Combinator, just like I have a lot to say about Trata Trata. Oh, thank you, Trotta, for sponsoring This Week in Startups and independent media like this. Trotta is a crowdsourced pay-per-click marketplace. We met Neil, the CEO, when Tyler and I were in Boulder. What a great company. Uh, they have a, a thousand paid search experts who will then create all the keywords and the copy for your ad. And any uh, startup knows there's three ways to get traffic. Social media, that works pretty well. There's Google SEO search you could do. That used to work well. Now it's uh, nobody knows how it works, apparently. The whole thing's been flipped upside down. I'm still trying my best, but we'll What's see. What's left? Hey, the paid <laughs> funnel works pretty well. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a paid product, hey, MailChimp makes money. You have uh, Zendesk. Those kind of companies tend to buy the keywords when you type in mail subscriptions. I'm sure if I did that, MailChimp would come up. Uh, or uh, other companies like Zendesk or whatever, to get satisfaction. These good companies, the, the, the software as a service companies, anybody with anything to sell, lynda.com, they all buy keywords, but they, it's a very interesting science slash art slash alchemy uh, process, and the people who do this are called SEM experts or search paid search experts. They're very hard to come by until now because Trata has a crowdsource group of a thousand of them, and they will go ahead and run your uh, campaign for you. If you are an SEM expert, go ahead and work for them uh, and become a partner. Just go to trotta.com. And there's a new promotion that we're running here at This Week in Startups from now until June 1st. If you sign up for Trotta and spend a minimum of $3,000, your company will receive a free ad on Twist read by Jason Calacanis. Wow. Who agreed to that? <laughs> that is a ridiculous offer. Uh, so go ahead and thank Twitter. Uh, thank Trotta on your Twitter. Go ahead and thank. It's your Geary. It's your humble honor to thank at Trotta. And hey, Thank at MailChimp as well. Let's hear the story. All right, so uh, startup incubator Y Combinator, it just keeps getting bigger. After accepting a record 44 startups in their last session, they've now upped the ante by allegedly accepting over 60 companies for summer 2011. Uh, just for comparison, last summer, 36 companies were in the uh, summer session of Y Combinator. It's not so hard to see why the, pro the program has become popular. Powerhouse startups like Reddit, Discuss, Dropbox, Justin TV, Heroku, Posterous, Airbnb, and more have all come from the incubator, not to mention Yuri Milner and Ron Conway's $150,000 convertible debt offerings to every company in the program. Crazy. So the question to you with six partners, three of whom are solely focused on providing advice and guidance, is Y Combinator going to start spreading itself too thin? And is there a danger of spoiling what makes it special by trying to take on too much? You know, it sure feels like it. Um, but then again, I don't know. I, I will say that this last class of Y Combinator companies, some mm -hmm. of the companies started to feel feature-ish, not product-ish, but I think time will tell because I would say that they are amongst the best angel investments I see. So, is it too many? It feels like it, mm -hmm. but are they better on average than the average angel investment coming through my front door? Yes, and I think many people feel that way. So, you know, but it does feel weird that all 60 get $150,000 without the person who's investing the money actually looking at the company and meeting the people. I don't think, and I know it's not dumb money because Jury's not dumb and mm -hmm. Ron Conway's not dumb, but it feels like a dumb money move, even though it's a smart move because it's a hedge fund move into a, something with an incredible track record. But I don't think that angel investing should work this way. Mm -hmm. I think it's anti-competitive in a way, and I think it's not in the best interest of the entrepreneurs. The entrepreneurs should be thinking, um, how does this angel investor help my business? And can I call them? Can I call them and get a meeting for one hour with them? Well, if there were 44 people in the last class and there's 60 out in this class, that means Yuri Milner has a hundred angel investments on top of Zynga and Facebook and the other important yeah, stuff other, that he's invested yeah. in. If he does this every year, three classes, there's going to be 180 <laughs> people a year. He's going to have 300 angel investments within two years. If he met with each one for one hour a year, it's basically yeah, it's impossible. Like a full-time gig, yeah. Well, it's two full-time gigs. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got to get to and from the meeting. You yeah. got to prepare for it. I mean, it's ridiculous. And so, while I'm all in favor as an entrepreneur for free money, I don't like the dynamic, the way it's going. Um, and so, I think that they should say, we're going to fund a third of the companies. Because, it, like I said, it feels anti-competitive. And, the, and then they actually meet and, with them yeah. and pick the ones they like and develop a relationship. I, if I was a Y Combinator company, I would take the money because it comes with no strings attached, it's free money. Yeah. But I don't like the concept of free money in this, and this whole dynamic. Uh, what do you think, Liz? Okay, so here's something that's 
might be a little spooky because I haven't really fully done the story on it yet, but what I've been hearing about the people that, that have been accepted to this latest class is that they're a lot further along, that there are companies that already have products, in some cases already have funding, they're, they've been around for a while, and I think that, that seems like a natural evolution in that the Y Combinator is such a great brand right now that they can get such competitive applications that they're not just taking like the two guys who, you know, who just graduated college and are still fine with the ramen dorm room experience. Like they, they're taking these companies that are really already companies and already have an idea, a product. And I think in that model, you don't need as much hands-on advice. It's not like the full hand-holding, you know, right. getting Paul Graham to walk you through every aspect of your startup. So then what are they then? They're just sort of like a little badge of honor you get. It's like an award medal. Oh, I'm Y Combinator. I got my yeah. passport approved. I gave 6% for $18,000. And then I get I make it back on the other round and the dumb money that comes after? Yeah, I think that's exactly what it is. Actually, in the last class when I was there um, at the demo day, there were two companies that had been accepted like a week before and just kind of added into the class because uh, – they, you know, basically to have that Y Combinator stamp because it's it's worth it to say it when you're raising money. That just mm. seems like the beginning of the end to me. Yeah, I mean, that feels if like you're so going different there, from where it started. Yeah, if you're going there just to get your stamp and your passport, passport mm -hmm. it feels bad. Like, I get people coming to me with that sometimes. Like, hey, I want you to angel invest, so you don't have to put any, people have said this to me, you don't have to put any money in, but I'm just going to lie and say that you're an angel investor because I know that your name will get me the next three guys. And then I'm thinking to myself, oh, free equity. But wait a second, yeah. if you're not... If you're willing to give away free equity to your company, your company doesn't have value, therefore you don't respect your own equity, or because I know I'm not worth that much. You know, so wait a second, this doesn't make any sense yeah. to me, so I turned it down because if you want to give me free stock, it's probably not a good company. Or yeah, it's pretty it. insane how free fast stock. they've responded and changed to the market. You know, like every class now, Y Combinator has expanded hugely, they've added partners, now it's like a totally different dynamic. So, I mean, I think you think of Y Combinator as the institution and like, I think all through the time, probably the only thing that's had in common is that people will complain about the companies being features, not not companies. You know, right. from the beginning. But everything else has changed. Yeah. Well, I mean, listen. If you if you if you only had three months to build it, it's going to be feature esque, not business esque. But of course, that these a lot of these features have turned into full blown businesses like Airbnb, which yeah. will be the first billion dollar business to come out of there. Actually, it will be the second. Dropbox would be the first. Mm -hmm. uh, Aaron, what do you, what are your thoughts on all this? Um, I mean, if it's I I. I Confess, I don't know a ton about uh, the interpinnings of uh, Y Combinator, but if you're getting um, not much hands-on guidance, even if you're a semi-experienced company, um, it seems a little bit expensive if, if you're established to trade away that much equity in your company for $150,000 when you could go to the bank and get that money and keep all of that equity to yourself. Um, I mean, if you're already established and you've got something that's pretty decent, um, then you know chances are you're going to have you know, better luck getting um, VC money down the road without the, the stamp. Yeah, so. I mean, and it's actually 6% for 18,000 or 12 to 18,000 for 6% that you give to Y Combinator in common, mm -hmm. and then you're giving 150 for some amount to Yuri that is unlimited cap. Whatever you can get, you get. So that money's kind of cool, but the first money is obviously giving away some. The companies that go through, though, are still speaking very positively of the experience. They are, right. So we ask them every time, they love it. And in, in regards to DST. And they keep going back. Yes, and in regard to the DST move, had they done the one third aspect, yeah. it wouldn't have they their name wouldn't have they wouldn't have got the marketing value that they. Did. No, I think it. they would. I, if they said I we're going to invest so. in half. No, it's brilliant. I think it was a brilliant marketing play on a marketing basis. The because, most brilliant. Yes, because ultimately, I don't. I mean, he obviously does care about the startups, but he's going into the much bigger Twitter like deals and everything, and the Facebook like deals. Yeah, I think it helps to be show a huge motion towards start up the community that yeah, he's, no, he's, he's here to play. Nobody would argue this is not the most brilliant move ever for Yuri. Right. It's absolutely the most brilliant. I mean, it's, it's brilliant only second and to buying a, the, the $75 million mansion in <laughs> and having a Y Combinator right. alumni party at and it. And doing, <laughs> doing the sort of MBA analysis on you know, Paul Graham and Y Combinator, yeah. it's actually not a bad investment, honestly. No, for 6%, if, you, if it does have that power, but now if everybody has it, you know, if, if 60 turns into 100, turns into 200, turns into 600 a year, what is, is it discerning enough? Now That's it, where now, it feels like it's not discerning. Now it's the alternative to, to getting an MBA. If you're, you're, getting, so. you're getting your Y Combinator, if you can get in. It used to be I, you wanted to get into Harvard, now you want to get into Y Combinator. <laughs> That's a good point. Very astute insight, Tyler. Insight from Tyler. All right, next story. All right. <laughs> Uh, oh, I gotta load it up. I'll go up here. 
I was looking for the Y Combinator uh, acceptance rate because somebody was asking about that mm -hmm. in the uh, in the chat room. I thought it was a good question, but I could not dig it up fast enough. Uh, That's so okay, one of the producers will tell us. Yeah, by the so way, somebody made a good point in the chat room before. Um, eBay still owned thirty percent of Skype, so eBay also quadrupled their money. So right. if they sold off seventy percent, they actually made a sh sugar ton of money doing this. I'm not putting another twenty bucks in here. <laughs> <laughs> I will not do it. All right. Next story, we're ready? Please, next story, I'm uh, ready. At the I.O. conference, Google launched a new Google Music service. It's similar in some ways to Amazon's recently released it's Cloud It's not important. Player. Move to the next story. That's it? That's it. Shh. Okay. I get, I get veto rights on that. It's not important. Move to the next story. I got <laughs> Which one was that? It's that not important. Google, Google Music. It's uh, not, it's not going to work. They're too far <laughs> behind. Music is iTunes. Move on to the next story. Fair enough. Uh, a new Facebook credits program introduces nah, ads. this is interesting. Includes ads, startups, social vibe, trial pay, and share through, and lets users earn money by watching video ads. Users can also download an app, take a poll, or interact with the site to get free access to features that are normally paid only. Apps can pay in Facebook-wide or app-specific virtual currency, or in real dollars that can then be donated to charity. Facebook has stated that their goal here is to get more people to use credits and carry a balance of Facebook credits in the system. Yeah. We know people will look at ads in exchange for access and content, but will they watch ads in exchange for virtual currency, or do you think it's like too many steps, it's too complicated? Well, I mean, Scamville showed that this worked. The whole Scamville, Mike Arrington uh, but investigative a, but piece. But a game. No, I know, but it's still, the, people are going to get this currency to go plant things right, in We go, Rule yes, or Farmville. Exactly. Liz, what are your thoughts on virtual currency here? Yeah, I mean, it's for people who would rather not spend cash, and um, if someone shows a com shoves a commercial in your face in order for you to get some random, you know, sword or eggplants or whatever you need in your game. I think some people will do it. Uh, a lot of people, I think, are going to do it. Especially the, kids and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, the kids especially who don't They're going to go crazy. Credit. I mean, yeah. they, they, there were kids signing up for DirecTV <laughs> and Netflix to get extra coins, thinking, oh, I'll just cancel it, or I can <laughs> cancel it. That's what their whole scam villain offers was about, was right. all those offer companies. And basically... Yeah, and that's what these companies already do. I mean, they just contract... Most of them work directly with the game providers. The difference right. is that Facebook is now approving it. So basically, somebody innovated on the Facebook platform, came up with this idea for offers and virtual currency to get things in games. Uh, so they get your attention, then you get something in the game, and then Facebook took that innovation away from the companies in their own ecosystem, slit their throats, and now it's in, built into the ecosystem, is what you're saying, Liz. Exactly. I love that I can summarize this and stuff, but I can just be like, so they cut their throat, they, they put the sword in them, and then they rub salt in the wound. Is that correct, Liz? Yes. Yes, basically <laughs> She's awesome. That. All the violence. See, I can say it like that. Liz can't, because she's got to have an ongoing... She's ha Liz has to have an ongoing relationship with all these people. These people all hate me already. Right. So that nobody didn't likes... You, didn't you hear that I'm ethically conflicted? Oh, yes, right. Your husband or partner or something, I don't even know, uh, is somehow got a, a ton of Facebook shares. That's what Mike Arrington said that you guys bought an island with your Facebook shares and you write love letters to Facebook all day. Is that what I read on TechCrunch? Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you did feel a little bit slandered by that piece, to be honest. I did, but, you know, it's like a badge. I, I'm fine with it. it yeah, no, welcome it to the... None of it was oh, true. I don't... I, I have... I, have yeah. uh, I mean, it's a complicated issue, right? Like, I, I, you know, I do have a relationship with someone who works there, but... I, I don't do not own any shares, and he didn't ask me before saying that I did. Well, this is classic Mike Arrington. Welcome to the club. I mean, basically, he will take anybody and throw them under the bus, uh, including his own partner, who made millions of dollars with him in a conference during production, and who, anyway, I'm going off on a tangent here. But <laughs> who is that? Let's see I don't know. Story. I don't know. Listen, I don't have any bad feelings about it. But, no, no. You know, like, listen, I trust Mike Arrington as far as I can throw him, and he's a big guy. Um, I, I'm not supposed to say anything <laughs> bad about Mike. I'm sorry, Mike. But I still don't feel good about it. Um, Aaron, what are your thoughts? Uh, Virtual currency, blah, blah, blah. I'm blah. waiting for uh, the gold farms to spring up all over China for uh, this, these Facebook ads. I think that if I were an advertiser, this is the last place I would put my money. <laughs> ah. it's, just, it's just asking to be gamed. And plus just the relationship it creates with users of I'm asking you to do a task, to, to view this ad as a task. Um, I just don't think that that's, that's going to be money well spent for advertisers. And the better thing would be to just produce a better ad? Yeah, produce a better ad that people actually are interested in. Produce a better product, perhaps? Yeah. Yeah, go. Well, that's crazy. Why produce a better product <laughs> when I can take that money and put it into a commercial that sucks and make you yeah, watch it's it? Like, it's like uh, paying to polish a turd. Insights <laughs> by Aaron. <laughs> You're supposed to no, play. Play it. I'll sing it along. <laughs> Insights by Aaron. You guys have to go to the Bay now, Bridge together. I get, I want, now it's going to be a competition of who can have more insights. It's like polishing a turd. Yep. 
Tyler. Oh, come on, that's like Tyler that's an obvious one. one third level. Grade. That's come third on. grade. That's not like a high level. <laughs> Sorry, Aaron. You're gonna have to bring many more insights it's to like the program. It's like a sea captain polishing a turd yeah, yeah. in a Corvette. Yeah. <laughs> that, would, that would be that would be the. Tyler you gotta get it. Yeah. No. Yeah. You okay. Let's go to the next grade. Next grade. Next grade. We're in the light. Okay. Now it's uh, 50 minutes. We're in the lightning round. That means whoever wants to answer the question, just jump in there and answer it. If anybody has anything hyper intelligent to say, then give a quick rebuttal, but let's get through All the last right. we got stories. four stories left. So hyper user, round, hyper round. Users can now connect services like SCV, NGR, and Foursquare to their American Express accounts and get credited for the deal through the standard card payment system. Foursquare has already launched their partnership back at South by Southwest. They gave participants a $5 mm -hmm. credit every time they spent $5. So other credit card companies you think are going to follow suit? You think they'll pursue mobile-based payments that incorporate their own deals? It's um, it's the under it's American Express is sort of the underdog is get it's, it has been very surprisingly active in embracing social media. Um, I know more than I can say, but it's, it's very impressive what they're up to. It is impressive that American Express is leading the pack, Visa, MasterCard, other people are not. And so this the is showing stuff with the square and everything, but I mean, American Express is like, wow, they're really getting into the. Well, I mean, thing. local merchants is their bread and butter, yes, right? Correct. So there's, there's, it's they have two constituents. They have the local merchant who they're charging in American Express case four percent, Visa two percent on average. I don't know something less. like that, three and one and a half. It's down to nowadays, um, and then you have what card do you pull out of your wallet and why? Mm -hmm. And so the. Is, does that mean Foursquare and Gowalla and Scavenger are going to be bought by these companies? I mean, it's, it's pretty self-evident. Scavenger is young kids using that. American Express is old business folks, and American Express needs to get the kids if they're going to, uh, uh, uh. you know. So, Did you I see were, there was also one more deal since then, which is they, um, American Express part, is partnering with Ven, Venti Privé. Is, is that how you say that? Yeah, yeah. Um, Venti Privé. Yeah. Privé. Yeah. <laughs> They're they're going to launch their U.S. site as in a partnership with American Express. I think that was just that just oh, came out yesterday. Oh, Ben Privé is coming to the U.S. Yeah, my my Mon colleague Trisha Durier had the had the story yesterday Mon morning. Mon Are they going to take the dash out of it? I mean, you know their domain has a dash <laughs> in it. Yeah, yes. I mean, the most successful company to ever come out of France, they have a dash in their name. Kind of Only the French. They, they, they overcame. They Only overcame the French. The dash. Yeah, exactly. Ah, but you know what? You have to give Van Privé uh, some credit. Van Privé was the first company to uh, use this big, bold imagery on their site and mm. the wall. Like you have to sign up to do it. And that, of course, has been copied by Bing, Gilt, and all this stuff. And Gilt will tell you they they just went over went after Van Privé <laughs> to the United States. Are they going to be successful in the U.S.? You think? Who knows? <laughs> I agree. I have the same yeah, answer. It's hard, hard to say. All right, people have a hard enough time pronouncing Mahalo, so. They're going to have to change that. Yeah. They're going to have to do something about that name in I mean, the U.S. The over French. There. Always the French. <laughs> like, it's kind of ironic that uh, credit card companies are pursuing uh, these check-in um, services because using a credit card is the original check-in, right? I mean, yeah. I don't know that they really need a check-in service for that. I don't know why they don't just do deals with uh, individual businesses one-on-one -on -one and create their own check-in stuff. Well, what if, if they said, would you like to share your purchase? And you but just checked it Blippi off. Well, that's what of, Blippi, yeah, which is an angel investment, that. was that was their premise, which is you, you, you get a credit card that's either a Blippi. They didn't tell me this, but I said, why don't you start a Blippi card? But you just take out your American Express card. It's attached to Blippi. Everything I do right. either it's goes public. Being and so you have shared, one that's your yeah. public credit card, and one's your private credit card. And you just when you swipe, it shows. And I love that part. But I mean, I review my stuff before I do it, which is kind of a... They should issue a Blippi It'd be card. interesting if the credit card... But I should get a rebate. Every time, if I use a Blippi card, I should get... 2% cash back. Yeah. That's the win. If you socially share your purchase, there's got to be some payoff. If the credit cards bought a social network, they'd have, they would know who the friends are of each of these yeah. people are that are buying. They already know your buying habit. Yeah. Yeah. But if they knew who your friends well, were that was as why well... I, and that's why I invested in Blippi. I thought it was an amazing team, and I thought it's a no-brainer that Facebook or Twitter or somebody buys this social network are pivoting around Purchases. Next story. Yeah, what you uh, so at, uh, also at Google's I.O. conference, Android developers got a sneak peek at the simplified Google TV interface the company plans to launch this summer. Not sure if you feel the same way about Google Music. We should just go no, right no, on. No, no, no. Keep going. Uh, changes are part of a significant retooling aimed at solving some of the consumer complaints about last year's inaugural Google TV rollout, which was criticized by many pundits and produced lackluster numbers. Google TV's Jason Bayer told the developers present that a main objective was to remove unnecessary features and make it easier and more intuitive for users to just get started watching TV or playing with apps, the new Google TV is going to run Honeycomb 3.1, the same version of Android that currently runs on tablets. So uh, do you think that the lackluster response to Google TV was a direct result of poor features, as Google <laughs> seems to think, or is there a deeper issue here like general lack of interest in the integration of TV and Internet? 
Anyone? It also cost a ton of money. It also was I mean, very expensive. The products that came on the market were super expensive, and yeah. they didn't. It wasn't really clear if they were giving you any content that you couldn't get already, and I think in a lot of cases they weren't. Yeah, I don't so, know exactly why I need Google products. TV. Well, well, they were tied to you. Was it, you had to buy like a, it was a cable buys, there was a Blu-ray player. There wasn't just like a Google TV box like it's there's an Apple be, TV box. It's got to be, I just ordered the LG, because I got a lot of stuff going on with video, obviously. Mahalo is producing 1,000 videos a week, and this weekend is producing 30 hours of content. I just bought the LG. Mm -hmm. It's sitting out here in the lobby. The LG connected TV, and I got the Samsung connected TV coming. When you turn the thing on, it's a, it's a Google TV-like experience. Right. Do you know who controls it? Samsung mm -hmm. <laughs> and LG. Why would they give that experience to Google? Because now they can sell these, they're making whatever they're making, 5% selling TVs. Now they've got all this upside in selling the real estate when you turn the TV on, and they all have Wi-Fi built in. The first generation of internet TVs, I was on an angel call with another company in this space that I can't say, but they had some good statistics you know, from publicly available data. It turns out like only 10% of the people with the Ethernet, with the Ethernet plug-in TVs actually bothered mm -hmm. to plug them in like I have on the Samsung, the right. old one. Mm -hmm. They said 60% of people with the Wi-Fi TVs actually enable it. Hmm. So nobody's going to take the time to run a cable over. You think that really that's it? No, you that's the statistic. Cable in the back. Is well, I mean, difference? think about it. You got to run it up through the wall. Gotta and you got to lay it on the floor. Oh, the furniture. I mean, you got kids. They're going to knock it over. I, like a dumbass, had my guy come in for three hundred bucks and run an <laughs> Ethernet cable. Right. And then I was like, oh my god, I can get my Yahoo stock, and it takes eight minutes to load this graphic at the bottom of my screen when I've already looked at it on my iPhone here. Like, I don't want that over there. What I want is a YouTube button on my remote. When I click YouTube, I get a six-foot experience. And I was at YouTube on Wednesday. And I think I don't have inside. <laughs> I do have inside information, but I can't say. But I think that this is about getting YouTube on the remote control of everything. Well, that's interesting because that's the Nintendo. They're saying the next Wii or whatever Nintendo comes out with yet, the controller is going to have a screen on it. You can access stuff right from there. Yeah, then so it syndicates that, it over idea. there. Right. Well, I mean, this is why Apple. I, I heard four years ago Apple was working on televisions. Five years ago from somebody in the orbit of Apple. I, we were on a press tour, mm -hmm. and somebody asked me about Apple, and I said, yeah, well, you know, they're coming out with televisions, that's gonna be the thing. He printed that, that's forever mm -hmm. memorialized in 2007, maybe 2008. Mm -hmm. Now it turns out the rumors come up again that they're gonna make TVs. It's so obvious they will make TVs, because people don't have the time to set this stuff up or figure right. it out. It has to just, you turn on the TV, and it's there. And if I could take this, and turn on my TV, and I'm what I see here, you see, and I'm looking at UTAB here, or I'm going through my, that's the win. Yeah. I mean, that's It'd be the really I'm smart if uh, if Microsoft, after the Skype purchase, if they, I mean, something you wrote in your newsletter, you said Xbox plus Connect plus Skype plus headset and two sets of friends equals social game platform at scale. But if Microsoft were smart, they'd combine Skype in there to have, uh, you know, one-to-one -one video conferencing in yeah. the living room. It's obviously and then if they shift, you know, kind of shift the context of computing, I feel like that's when... Uh, they can find vulnerabilities in Facebook and other competitors. Yeah, I mean, I love this move. By, finally, Microsoft did something that could actually move the needle in terms mm -hmm. of their internet and, and having a loved brand. And actually, I tell you something. I've been talking to my family members, other people about Bing. People like Bing. Yeah. Bing users like Bing. And I, I'm a little PO'd at Google because of the Panda thing, so I was like, I'm going to get my revenge. I'm going to put <laughs> my, my new default search engine is Bing. And I, I've been using Bing over here. There's only one time, it's only one use case where I switch back. Can you guess the one use case where, you, where Bing does not work well as your default search engine? You were looking for a specific YouTube video? Nope. Hmm. No, video is good. Maps. Which one? Maps are location based. Nope, maps actually are good. like Bing Maps are Bing actually maps really are good. Dope. I, I like no. those. There was only one, but you guys are getting close. You're triangulating. It wasn't maps. It wasn't video. Images. No, images is images. Yeah, images is great. Images is great on Bing, and actually, Google changed their image to match Bing's. Mm -hmm. I mean, Google that was a kick in the ass to Google. Is ass a? No, I think you're no, right. I think I'm okay. Uh, no, the, news. You got it. News sucks on Bing. This is a message to Yusuf <laughs> at Bing. Fix the goddamn news piece because I'm doing my ego search for Calacanis. I can't find news. I do an ego search for this company, for that That's company. Interesting too, it's not this news search is not good. Google News is so competitive to get in. All the companies want to get into the Google News and they're not accepted. It's interesting that it might be an opening for. for I just Google. think everybody should just do Bing for a week or two, and see if they switch back. And because switching takes mental energy and time, yeah. everybody do it if you haven't. Switch to Bing. 
and then will you do it for a week? I was using Bing because no, we had it, them as sponsors. Yeah, yeah. Will you do it for the week though? We would talk sure. about it next Friday. Do it for yes. the, we're talking about it next Friday. If you're paying, absolutely. Yes, just do it, try it for a week. <laughs> I did it. On, I didn't do it on my desktop, but I did it on my, on my laptop. But I did it on my iPad, and you, the, we're big iPad users. Also true. So last the, story. Last. Well, the Google TV. It comes down to the Google TV. Apple, Apple TV is a failure too. Well, fine. But the real, it's it's the Google platform versus the Apple platform. Right? Yes, who gets a television? It's like they, they're both getting the laptops and the tablets mm -hmm. and the phone. Netbooks. And now it's going into yes. the TV. Who wins? Fine, but there's that's not necessarily the end. So that one platform is more open, the Android type platform, right? Yes. Uh, Apple is not going to get into washing machines and hot water heaters and all right. that. Right, and they're Android will. Android and Android will. Lo launched Android Home. Great. Well, this At is my IO. point. That it's, was the sleeper of IO, wasn't it? I think it was because, as a platform, it's going to be hardware agnostic. Google's not getting into the hardware. Apple is, so Apple's not going to do all that stuff. And you're going to have this platform that's going to suck if up you everything. Are, yes. So Samsung and LG will put not only Google on their. TVs, but they'll right. also put. Will we see Apple buy LG or Samsung's TV business or somebody's TV business? Anybody? No, they've never done that. No. Why wouldn't somebody yeah. buy a plasma I, TV I, business? I think it's not in their we'll DNA that they, they they come out with a whole. Yeah, they, it wouldn't provide that holy experience of it's like. It's got to be. Yeah. That's the of, no, I know, but that's the genius the move. That's the genius move. Steve Jobs. It's got to be exactly to his specification. Less story, less story, less story, less story. Uh, well, I'll give you a choice. One, one thing on that is, is uh, I think that maybe the, one of the more interesting things out of I.O. was that, the, oh, no, did my video cut off? Don't worry about it. We hear uh, you perfectly. Yeah, it was just just to say that the, the, that Google TV session was um, one of the most well attended of the conference. It was like a line, line, lines and lines and lines to get in. So the I think it's interesting to know that they have the developer attention and the developers would want to have a consistent platform on Android across all these devices. And if people are developing for it, um, Google could have an advantage, whereas like Apple are, still has that advantage on uh, the mobile app side. Yeah, I agree. So for the last story, you've got a choice. Twitter for Mac or Lady Gaga and Zynga? Oh my God, can I say none of the above? Liz, what's the most important story that we missed? Mm -hmm. Or Aaron, what's the most important story we missed? Yeah, why don't you? I'll go. Anybody uh, have an important story? I mean, the lady, who cares about Lady Gaga and Zynga? It got Lady Gaga got downvoted. I've never oh, seen the I'm so reaction. I'm so annoyed with Lady Gaga right now. To like this now. article, do I, I want to? I want. I do not want to plant. Well, now we're talking about it. So we I know, but I don't want to plant things in Lady Gaga's garden. Like sheep riding motorcycles? <laughs> I feel like I'm going to be in Lady Ga Gaga's garden planting something. You know what? That's exactly what you're going to be. That's the. Is that literally it? Yeah, Gagaville. Oh, no, 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 you're kidding. I, that was my joke. Pop sensation Lady Gaga's partnering with Zynga for a large-scale promotion for her new album, Born This Way. It's all going to happen within the game of Farmville. Players will be able to visit Gagaville, a neighboring farm featuring buildings, decorations, and animals inspired by Gaga videos. As well, players will be able to stream portions of Born This Way and even purchase $25 gift cards that will include the album, exclusive Gaga virtual items, and a chance at winning Gaga concert tickets. Lady Gaga said of the deal, Zynga has created a magical place in Farmville where my fans can come play and be the first <laughs> to listen to the new album, Jason, Your Thoughts. <laughs> oh, Lady Gaga said. Gagaville. Like, you see, there's little, there's sheep riding motorcycles, there's crazy, you know, monster stuff. The thing, I don't, the thing that's crazy about this is that it's going to be successful. It's going to work. Oh, Jumping the shark. Facebook, it's the end of the industry. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we just jumped the shark, yeah. baby. Oh, what an episode. Is there anything important that we missed, Liz? Tell, please tell <laughs> me there's something more important. Tell me there's something more important than this. Well, you know the story that I was actively covering last night, which is kind of silly, but I felt like I once I started I yes, it through was that, that blogger, Google's blogging service, which is like huge, yes. uh, was down for, for a day. Yes. Did anybody notice? Yes, all people on it, but you know. All, all the spammers it, um, in uh, Mumbai who are all the personal it. bloggers use it. Oh, there are personal bloggers. So that was down for a day. Yeah, yeah. And they still haven't recovered all the posts that were, you know, were made in the last couple of days. That they they removed them all and are in the process of bringing them back. I just got a breaking news story. Paris Hilton actually is white labeled Twitter. <laughs> it's going to be called Hitter. It's good. Absolutely, it's going to be incredible. It's going to be your own Paris Hilton version of Twitter. You can sign up and give <laughs> updates from the club at any time. And you can say hot. It's, it's basically oh, you have a choice of three different tweets. It's what's hot, hot what, right now. Hot. That's hot. <laughs> yeah. And huge. You can only do those three tweets. Yeah. And she nobody said, cares about Paris Hilton yeah. anymore. I know. I'm showing. Sure I'm dating myself. Yeah, wow. Right. Oh my God. I'm so two thousand. I'm so two thousand six.
Yeah, Bieber's Bieber's watching, yeah. Bieber, white label Twitter. Bieber's going to be in Mafia Wars next. Yeah, That's Bieber up. Mafia Wars, we'll absolutely. That. Bieberville. Look out for that. Uh, Liz Gaines, thank you so much for joining us. You did a great job on the program. Um, and everybody can follow Liz Gaines at Liz Gaines, L I Z G. A N N E S, and if you want to buy some of her Facebook shares in Second Market, contact <laughs> Arrington at uh, TechCrunch.com. Aaron Walter is the genius, genius, genius product uh, developer, manager, UX god uh, at Mailchimp, and you can follow him at Aaron A A R R O N. And Lon Harris, of course, is the founder and CEO of Ranker.com. No, just, just, just the, just the director of content. Yeah. Really? Just a director just, of content? Just senior director right. of content. So we say co-founder and director of content. Fair enough. Of course, <laughs> Tyler Crowley is, of course, uh, my consigliere and uh, the CEO of Squeal. Squeal, Squeal, what a deal. If you have a local business, go over to Squeal and get information. I saw the mock-ups of the stuff you're doing for that yoga place. That's pretty tight. Uh, and thank you to the tech team for another flawless episode. And thank you to our sponsors, Trotted and MailChimp. We'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money. Spend the money and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money. Spend the money and defeat you.